After working as an astrophysicist for like 10 years or so now and being completely immersed in the community and the field, there's obviously been a lot of hype around JWST and there's certain things that I expected it to be able to do, like characterise the atmospheres of exoplanets or find incredibly distant galaxies in the universe. But I did not have JWST observing an asteroid in the solar system with rings passing in front of a distant star on my JWST bingo card. But you know, it's 2023, the year of our telescope and research saviour JWST, and this is just where we are now, where it feels like it's constantly surprising us. So this asteroid known as Chiriklo orbits the Sun somewhere in between the orbits of Saturn and Uranus, and it just so happened that back in October of 2022, it passed in front of a very distant star in the Milky Way from JWST's perspective. You know, in the same way that you can block out the moon with your thumb, or the moon might pass in front of Mars. We call this an occultation, where one object in the foreground passes in front of another object in the background. JWST then observed a dip in the brightness of that star as Chiriklo blocked the light for a very brief moment. But instead of like one large dip in the brightness like what we see for example when exoplanets pass in front of the stars that they orbit and reveal that they're there. For Chiriklo, JWST recorded two very sharp dips in the brightness of the star as it passed in front of it. And the best way that we can describe that data that we've collected is that the main body of the asteroid of Chiriklo actually just missed the star. But Chiriklo has a ring system around it, similar to the rings we see around the gas giants like Saturn and Uranus. And it's one side of the ring and the other side of the ring passing in front of the star that caused those two very sharp dips in its brightness. Now, just a heads up, this research hasn't been peer reviewed yet. So there's no research paper that accompanies the NASA press release that they put out with all the data and the images just yet, which means I can't link anything in the video description down below for you to read, except for the NASA blog, which has been written by the researchers who asked to use JWST for these observations. But once the research paper describing all these observations has been published, I'll come back to this video and I'll link it down in the video description below if you're watching perhaps in the far future. Now I noticed when NASA announced this news that there was a lot of things people were confused about or were questioning about this result on social media. So that's when I knew, you know, we needed to chat about this in a video. So I put a shout out on Instagram for all of your questions and the things you still didn't understand. And boy, did you guys <laughs> deliver. So I went through all of your questions and picked out, you know, the most common ones that kept cropping up a lot. First of all, how did JWST know where to look for an asteroid with rings? Second of all, why didn't JWST spot the light from the star that had been blocked by the actual asteroid itself? Third, how do we know that this is even a ring and not something else that's causing the dip in the light? And fourth, how normal is it for asteroids to have rings? This seems pretty weird. And five, what's the point in observing an asteroid with rings? Why do we even care? We know there's lots of things that JWST could look at, so why is it looking at this? So let's start with that first question. How did JWST even know where to look for this thing? Well, Chariklo was discovered back in 1997 at the Kitt Peak Observatory in Arizona. And it's estimated to be around about 250 kilometers across, which would make it the largest known centaur asteroid, which are the asteroids that orbit between the gas giants, and in this case for Chariklo, it's between Saturn and Uranus. So we've known about it for a fairly long time now, and we know its orbit very well, which means we can predict where it's going to be in the sky at any given time, and therefore we know if it's ever going to come close to having an occultation with a star. Now occultations are a pretty common occurrence for asteroids, just because there's a lot of asteroids and there's a lot of stars, so the probability that an asteroid is going to pass in front of a star is, is quite likely. And occultations can actually tell us quite a lot about the asteroid that's passing in front of the star. For example, we can work out what size the asteroid is. 
Now, Cherry Clow had an occultation with another star back in 2013, and it was those observations that first revealed the rings around it. This was work by Braga Rebus and collaborators from 2014, which I've linked in the video description down below if you want to check it out. And it was done with the Danish 1.54 meter telescope in La Silla. Chile. Now they detected the occultation showing where the asteroid itself passed in front of that background star and blocked the light for five seconds. But it also revealed four other dips in the brightness that lasted for just a fraction of a second, suggesting that Chariclo had two rings around the asteroid, one much thinner and sparser than the other, and so it didn't cause as big of a dip in the brightness. It was then by chance that Pablo Santos Sanz realized that there would be another occultation of Cherry Clo with a different star in October 2022 and applied for time to observe it with JWST. The second question a lot of you had was, why didn't JWST detect the asteroid blocking light from the star this time? So unlike the occultation seen back in 2013, this time JWST only detected the dips in brightness from the rings and not from the asteroid. We're missing that central very long dip in the brightness that's caused by the asteroid. This is because of how precise the alignment of these two things has to be for us to be able to capture this. JWST just happened to be looking from slightly the wrong angle so that from its perspective, the main body of the asteroid passed just underneath the star. To put this into perspective, when the rings were first discovered back in 2013, it was only visible in a very narrow strip across South America. The observatories marked by the green dots here actually saw the occultation, whereas the ones with the blue dots didn't see any change in the brightness of the star. What's more is that the green dots that you can see that are outside the solid lines but inside the dotted lines only saw the dips in brightness due to the rings and not the main body of the asteroid. So the alignment has to be perfect to capture this. And hopefully that'll help you understand more, you know, what JWST saw and why it saw what it saw. The alignment was just off, so the asteroid passed just below the star. The third question you had was, how do we know these dips in brightness are caused by rings and not something else? Like, for example, there could be a system of asteroid moons all orbiting Cherry Clow. Or perhaps there could even be jets of material thrown off the surface, you know, kind of like a, a geyser that we see on Earth, which we've seen before from the surfaces of comets. Well, it's all to do with the shapes of those dips in brightness that we observe. You can see how the asteroid where it blocked the light and where the ring blocked the light are two very different shapes in the data from the occultation back in 2013. And you can see how the dips in brightness from the rings are symmetrical around the middle of the asteroid itself. So it's unlikely to be due to a more chaotic process like, for example, jets from the asteroid's surface. Then because these dips are so constant Concentrated. You know, it's just a very brief dip of the light lasting a fraction of a second. To get that pattern with a system of little asteroid moons, you would have had to have had the exact same arrangement of those moons in the 2013 occultation as you would in the 2022 occultation with JWST. And as we've just heard, the alignment of these occultations is hugely subject to change if it's not quite perfect. So again, that's very unlikely. Plus, again, you have that symmetry either side of the asteroid itself and getting that with a little moon system is, again, very unlikely. So the most likely explanation for the data that we have is that this asteroid has a ring system. The next question that I saw pop up a lot was generally along the lines of asteroids have rings? What? How? Why? Yep, us astronomers are as surprised as you are. This was a completely unexpected discovery back in 2013. It was thought that rings could only survive around much more massive objects like the gas giants. But then another ring was discovered around Haumea in 2017, which is one of the largest of the dwarf planets beyond Neptune, has this odd sort of rugby ball shape. And it's now suspected that another centaur asteroid called Chiron has a ring too. 
you. So perhaps rings around asteroids aren't as weird as we first thought. And obviously that then raises the question of, okay, well then how do they form? And one idea is that you could have an impact with a much smaller asteroid, which would then throw up debris off the surface. And then as the asteroid continued to rotate, that would be pulled down into like a flat disc in the same way that, you know, if you take pizza dough, throw it above your head, set it spinning, it flattens out into a disc. And then maybe the asteroid does have a, a little moon, another asteroid moon that's orbiting around it. And that moon is what shepherds that material into a very thin ring instead of it staying in a flat disc. If that's the case, then those impacts become much more likely with a bigger asteroid, just because there's a bigger cross-sectional area for little lumps of rock to hit into it. So bigger asteroids are more likely to have rings than smaller ones. That's hopefully something we could answer in the future if we could get data on a number of differently sized asteroids uh, out amongst the gas giants. But then that raises the question of why the main belt asteroids between Jupiter and Mars don't seem to have rings. Again, we don't really know the answer to this question, but people have speculated that it could be due to the fact that in the asteroid belts, the impacts will occur at much greater speeds because the asteroids themselves are orbiting the sun at much faster speeds, which means that any debris thrown up is probably going to be thrown much further rather than a very slow impact where the debris will probably hang around more around the asteroid's surface. That's all speculation though. Ideally, we need more data to answer that question. So there's a lot more work still to be done here to answer the question of why do asteroids have rings? And finally, the last question you all had was, what is the point in all of this? What can we actually learn by observing an asteroid with rings? Well, it all comes back down to, it's perhaps the biggest question of all really, life on Earth. How did it start and where did all the water come from that it so clearly needs to thrive? One idea is that comets and asteroids impacting when the very hot early Earth, as it cooled, brought all of the water to Earth over time with many, many impacts. And what are the rings of asteroids and planets made out of? Well, a bit of dust. And then also ice. Not only did JWST observe the occultation of cherry clow, but another group of scientists, Heinz and collaborators, proposed to take a spectrum of cherry clow, where you take the light and you split it into its component wavelengths to reveal the fingerprints of the molecules present that are absorbing a very specific wavelength of that light, so that you get a drop in brightness at that wavelength. Here is that data taken by the near-spec instrument on board JWST. And you can see these regions where we're not detecting as much light at those wavelengths, which we know correspond to the H2O molecule, water ice. Now, as we observe the asteroid Chiriclo at the minute, we're collecting reflected sunlight off the surface of both the asteroid itself and the rings around the asteroid. But... As the asteroid rotates on its axis, those rings will tip and tilt with respect to us here on Earth or with respect to JWST. In the same way that we see Saturn's rings tilt so that they're edge on or face on from our perspective as Saturn rotates and we see them from different angles. So over time, as Chirico tips on its axis, we'll start to see those rings less and less and less. So that if we go back and observe it again with JWST, we'll have more light just from the asteroid and not as much from the rings themselves. Then we can compare sort of like before and after with rings and without rings to work out what contribution do the rings make to that spectrum and therefore what are they made of and what is the asteroid Chiriclo made of. And if it is the rings that are made from water ice, is that then where all the water on Earth came from? Rings around asteroids in the far reaches of the solar system. So two little dips in brightness might not have seemed that exciting at first to you, but it confirms the hope that with more JWST observations over the next 10, 15, 20 years of its mission lifetime, it should be able to help tackle the big outstanding questions that we still have over the origin and evolution of the solar system and how we all came to be. 
Before we get to the bloopers, a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Brilliant.org is a website and an app that teaches you maths and science with thousands of interactive lessons and new ones added every single month. The interactivity is really what makes Brilliant stand out, getting you to learn by doing and immersing yourself in a topic that lets you work on your physical intuition for what's going on. If you want a career in a STEM field, then Brilliant can help give you that edge to your CV with new skills that help you stand out. The big important concepts are broken down into manageable chunks. Like for example, you might have always wanted to learn how to code, but struggled. Well, Brilliant breaks down the big important concepts into manageable chunks to make it easier for you to pick up a new skill. So if that sounds like something you'd be up for, you can sign up completely for free at brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky. I've popped that link in the video description down below as well. And if you go to that link, you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. At that link, you'll also find my curated learning path for you with the courses I reckon cover the concepts we chat about the most in my videos. So thank you again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. Finally, why do we even care about an asteroid with rings? What can we learn? What's it all about, Cherry Clow? But then another ring was discovered around Haumea in Haumea, 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 Haumea. Pronounce. Also, if you don't like the way I've been pronouncing Cherry Clow, I found a video from the New Horizons team, and they pronounced it that way in the video. So, if you have qualms with my pronunciation, you can take it up with the New Horizons team. How may I? How may I? Like, how may I? But how may I? How may I? How may I help you? Do you know what? I've just realised that in all of my notes, it doesn't actually say Chiriclo. It says... Charlico. <laughs> like, I know it's called Chiriclo. Like, I checked, you know, how you say it before I started, like, writing notes for this video. And yeah, I've written it. Every time I've written it, I've written... Charlico. <laughs> Space is hard, words are harder. <laughs> Premium subscription. Oh, I am being wrong. Oh yeah, the radio. Hello? Hello Becky. Hiya, how are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thanks, you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Is this line or? <laughs> Oops, I totally forgot that I was on the radio on BBC Oxford chatting about asteroids. Not this asteroid, but the one that like came really close to the Earth uh, last night. Not a danger or anything, but fun story. So, 